Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide online divorce mediation and valuation services in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we will discuss the current housing market and divorce with Melissa Rubenstein. She is a former real estate attorney and a current realtor in New York and New Jersey and has a lot of interesting perspectives in real estate, where everything's going. Welcome, Melissa. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. So this is an interesting topic. We were kind of talking about um, some of the things that were happening just in the context of a divorce that I had recently. And I was kind of talking to you about some of the things that we should consider in the divorce. And you really had some interesting perspective. But I think if we start, you know, in this pandemic, in the post pandemic, during the past, even to like since 2008, the housing market has gone through these various time periods of struggle and, and, you know, increase and people are excited, but like what's happening right now. And maybe where have we gone in the past two years? So the past two years have probably been the most interesting time period in real estate, definitely since 2008 and possibly in the past few decades. Um, prior to the pandemic, 2019, um, we had a pretty normal real estate market. Um, we did have inventory issues, but our rates were steadily at four to five percent. We had a lot of buyers in the market. We had sellers. Um, then, of course, the pandemic hit and everything changed. You, The biggest change we had first was interest rates. Interest rates went down from mid fours to as low as two and a half percent, which changed the face of the real estate market entirely. Um, we had people entering the market who previously couldn't afford to be in the market. Um, we had huge rises in home ownership. Even during the pandemic, we were in here in New Jersey, we were sidelined probably for about six weeks, but we were considered essential workers. So we hit the ground running April to May of 2020. And we saw volume like we hadn't seen in years. People were taking advantage of the low interest rates. They were putting on all of their PPE and their masks and going into houses and buying houses. The consequence of a year of that and extremely low rates were we've eaten up all the inventory. So mm -hmm. over the last six months, we've had incredible incredibly low inventory. And even as rates have gone from the lows of two and a half percent to highs around six percent, we are still getting high prices because of this lack of inventory. Well, and I think that it's interesting because it's not only lack of inventory, I think that buyers' preferences have changed. You know, like at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody wanted to live like walking distance from places and be in the city and everything. And then right. when you're kind of locked into your own nucleus, right? I think people, at least in the Midwest, started to move out, have more land, like have less neighbors and things like that. Did you see the preferences change? We saw the same thing out here. So I'm in the New York City suburbs. Our suburbs are generally commutable to Manhattan. So back in 2019, walkability was the word. Everybody wanted walkability. They wanted a downtown. They didn't care about a big yard because they wanted to walk everywhere. Once people were at home with their children, with their spouse, they wanted more space. They wanted not only land, but a pool used to be a neutral. Some people wanted it. 50% of the people didn't ever want it. Now, especially let's say over a million dollars for our luxury market, a pool is an almost must. Everyone wants a pool, everyone wants land, and the physical features of a house, those preferences changed as well. In 2019, open concept was everywhere. People just wanted one open floor plan, they could entertain, they could you know, enjoy their house like that. Well, once you had 
often two parents working in a house. Then maybe you had two or three kids homeschooling in a house. You needed actual rooms in your home. People want a home office. Even if they're commuting in two days a week, they still need a home office and perhaps two home offices for three days a week because their kids may come home from school at 3.30 in the afternoon and they're still on conference calls. So the features of a house have definitely changed. And we're walking that back a little bit. People don't need the McMansion anymore. They just want enough space that they can comfortably coexist with every member of their family. Mm -hmm. Well, and have you seen any, the other two, before we kind of get into how this co this conversation about how the current housing market affects divorce and how it, you know, how it involves it. You, there's also kind of two different areas that I think affect, you know, this type of population as well is one is, you know, secondary homes sure. or investment homes. You know, what have you seen in that capacity? Um, Cause it, it could be called vacation homes, but now we're seeing so many of the vacation homes like become these Airbnbs or these condo situations. Like sure. what are you seeing in that space? Um, well, you can almost not get a vacation home anymore, um, mm -hmm. especially on the East Coast from Florida to Maine, beach homes, lake homes. At the beginning of the pandemic, especially people who were apartment dwellers in the city, they grabbed up every single beach house, every single lake house and lived there for a year. Mm -hmm. And then they went back to the city, but they held on to those investment properties. And now they're either using them themselves or renting them out. Um, Airbnb is something that I'm dealing with a lot actually lately because I've had several of my buyers say that they want to use a property both for themselves and for Airbnb. And it's something that you really have to work with somebody knowledgeable because each town has different short-term rental rules. Many, many areas are uh, having ordinances against short-term rentals under 30 days. So it's something that you really have to research because the last thing you want to do is buy that investment property, put it up on Airbnb and have the town, the municipality that you're in tell you, nope, you can't do a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. Well, and in, in to segue a little bit into divorce, in the divorce, you know, space, what, what some of the things that we're seeing is these rental homes or really just vacation homes, right? Have been in the family, maybe paid off, right? That one party would say, well, you can go and you can make some income off of this because you can start renting it out. It's going to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. But what we found is, especially in condos or apartments or where there's some structure, even in um, older neighborhoods, there's indentures and things. And, and you're also a real estate attorney, which I think yeah. gives a, a another perspective, like when somebody's looking at some of these options, you know, they may have to get some additional advice, not just from a realtor, but like this goes a little bit beyond, right? If someone's going to use a home as an investment property, I would always recommend contacting a real estate attorney, um, somebody who's familiar with land use, with ordinances in the specific town. Because while a realtor can maybe go through the ordinances or make a phone call, if you're talking about that kind of income, that kind of investment, or if you're talking about a divorce, dividing up the property, you want to know exactly what you can do with that property. It's also important to note that with the rise of Airbnb, many municipalities haven't caught up to the ordinances yet. So there, I told a client this the other day, okay, you're looking at one county, you're saying some of the municipalities have short-term rental laws, some of them don't, well, I'm going to buy in one that doesn't. It may be that they don't because they haven't caught up yet. And their council is going to pass a short-term rental law, you know, next week. You want to move into a town, you want to use a town that has addressed this already. It's been in front of their council, their mayor. They, you know what their short-term rental laws are before you consider whether that's an income producing property. Well, and just like the ordinances are taking time to get started, you know, we've seen, I think we even talked about like on one of our pre-calls in Branson, Missouri, which is like this little sleepy town right. of like fun and chaos, right? A family kind of vacation town. They're starting to build these smaller, and I was there recently and even saw it, like these smaller houses, like not tiny homes, 
but definitely like geared towards this this market of owning a property, wanting to be there some weeks or a month or so out of the year, but then renting it and kind of having it pay for itself. So I feel like as we go forward, there's going to be way more management companies and even neighborhoods that are created based on this concept, especially in like tourist towns, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people, this is what people want now. They want their home, but they also want a second home, a vacation home, and something that's income producing. Yeah.